Legal Aid Association of California's Trainings on Senior Legal Issues, also known as the Armchair Trainings. My name is Sydney Howe, and I'm the AmeriCorps VISTA here at LAC. Today's session is the first part of our series on elder abuse. This training is Financial Elder Abuse Basics with Akiko Takashida of Asian Pacific Islander Legal Outreach. Before we get started, I just want to give you all a few logistical notes. Firstly, if you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to email me at showe at pic.org. Again, that's showe at pic.org, and I will be able to assist you. I also want everybody to know that you are all muted, uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send us your questions using the question box. There will be about five or ten minutes at the end of the session during which questions will be answered. Um, you can also use the question box if you are having technical difficulties. If you would rather do that, then email me. Um, this session will also be recorded and materials will be posted online after the training, so you will have um, access to those materials uh, later on if you wish. Um, I would also like to remind everybody that this session is approved for one hour of MCLE credit. Certificates of attendance will be mailed out after the training. In order to receive credit, you must be signed into the webinar for the full hour. The GoToWebinar service compiles everyone's in session times, and we will be going over everyone's in session times prior to sending out the certificates. So please feel free to contact us if you have any questions regarding MCLE. And with that, I will turn it over to Akiko. Thank you, Sydney. Um, this is a session on uh, financial elder abuse. My name is Akiko Takeshita with Asian Pacific Islander Legal Outreach. We're located in San Francisco. Uh, we do domestic violence, prevention, family law, elder law, which also includes uh, elder abuse, as well as immigration. We have a naturalization program for seniors here. Um, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint, which I'm going to start now. Uh, what is elder abuse, financial elder abuse? I kind of have a yawning man there because oftentimes people kind of look at me and their eyes kind of glaze over when I talk about elder abuse. Um, plain English definition, misuse of an elder's assets, usually by way of theft, fraud, intentional uh, misuse by a caregiver or fiduciary, negligent use of assets, basically lying, stealing, or breaking a promise. I mean. That's basically what it breaks down to. There's a bunch of different statutes that I will provide for you and include in this, but basically that's what it is. And um, the next page is, what's the big deal about elder abuse? Um, partly, we have an aging population. Um, it's finally receiving a lot more attention, basically because we are an aging population. Based on the uh, 2000 census, reports have estimated that over 6 million people will be over 65 by the year 2025. Baby boomers are approximately 26% of our population. And this was um, by a study by MetLife Insurance in 2009. And they estimate over 2.6 billion, that's with a B, lost revenue by victims of financial elder abuse. Um, in California, in the census in 2000, there were 3.5 million people over 65. So it just kind of gives you an idea of potential for problems as our population ages. And one of the other things that uh, we find practitioners um, within elder abuse law is a lot of, there's a lack of resources to effectively fight elder abuse as the problem grows. And basically, Depending on what, what study you look at, it, it varies as to uh, what percentage of elder abuse is uh, financial. It ranges from between 40 to up to 60 percent of all elder abuse. But today we're just speaking specifically about financial abuse. Um, some history. Prior to 1979, there weren't any statutes specific to elder abuse used to have to use um, common count, like a conversion or fraud or misrepresentation if you wanted to file a, a civil action to, to recover losses of, of, or theft by, by someone against an elder. Uh, 1980, uh, 1980, there were about five states that had statutes that were specifically aimed to protect elders. And elders basically someone over 65. 
1985, 44 states had statutes, 1991, 50 states, and then in uh, 2003, the Elder Justice Act was introduced, and it kept getting, um, you know, uh, basically they didn't deal with it for a long time, and a version was approved in 2008 under the Health Care Reform Act, uh, but it was not what the, or of course, wasn't what the original bill was set out to be. A lot of it was cut out of it. And basically, um, it will provide funds to adult protective services and other prevention of elder abuse. The problem is we're not sure if it's going to be funded, so we have to see how that goes. Um, adult protective service is basically a county uh, administered office, so it's every county will have an office that deals with uh, investigating and reporting of elder abuse and trying to hook them up with the social services to help the victims to try to, um, to get away from the harm or the problem that they're facing. And um, San Francisco has a very good adult protective service. We get a lot of referrals from them. A lot of the laws that we have were out of the laws to protect elders after legislation addressing um, child abuse, but of course there's a lot of differences in what happens to an elder versus a child, and plus when, it, when you deal with financial abuse, children usually don't have assets and elders often do. Why elders are susceptible to financial abuse? One of the reasons is that a lot of times people, elders, may not know what the value of the assets are. And I'm, I'm kind of talking about things like real property. You know, you could buy a home in 1980 for, you know, $50,000, and now in, in the Bay Area it could be worth, you know, 750, 800, maybe 900,000. And some of the elders, they may not be aware that it appreciated to that amount. I have people who will come in, and we also do um, some simple estate plans, and uh, they'll tell me they bought a house, you know, for fifty thousand, and and I ask them, what do you think the fair market is, and they'll say, well, three hundred or four hundred thousand. So if if an unscrupulous person came up to them and said, I'll give you, you know, four hundred thousand, they might think that's a good deal. So lack of awareness of the value of the assets, managing finances are, is just getting more complicated, partly due to technology and just partly due to all the changes in how the banks operate. A lot of them are trying to push people into using um, the computer. And, you know, a lot of my seniors may not have access to a computer or they're, they're intimidated by using that, you know, or using the phone or ATM machines. Uh, another one is loneliness, isolation, and partly uh, other health issues. Loneliness, isolation, there's a tendency that an elderly person will talk to people who contact them, you know, by phone or through the mail. They will, like, respond and, you know, follow up. Some, they'll get a form in the mail and they think it looks official. They'll fill it out and mail it back in. So those types of things, you know, we do a lot of outreach to try to, to get the word out that they shouldn't be doing those types of things. Um, health issues, a lot of them will have different levels of health issues. It could be physical, it could be, you know, mental, uh, and uh, they're just basically not on, on top of things when they're not uh, feeling well, as any of us would probably not be doing well. So they're, it's easy for them to get careless. Uh, they may not follow up on their bank statements on a regular basis, things like that. Uh, they're more prone to just allow people to talk them into things. That's another part of elder abuse that we are always looking out for. Perpetrators of abuse, basically um, one of the problems we have is there's really no main way of collecting data. There's no federal system. It's usually state by state, and then, of course, it's inconsistent. You know, there's different statistics depending on which report you look at about, you know, for every case that's reported, there's five that aren't reported or there's ten that aren't reported or, or whatnot. Um, also, they don't always divide out elder abuse, the physical type of abuse, from the financial. 
And um, so it's kind of hard to really nail down a number. But we do know the types of perpetrators that have been reported. Majority will be under the family, friends, neighbor, caregivers. These are people who have a relationship. They're close. You know, they have contact, close contact with an elderly person. They get to know this person. They get to know um, what their assets are, how they, how they do things, what what their their course of uh, normal behavior is, who the the people that they are in contact with. The elder gets uh, maybe might feel that oh they have someone that they could depend on and uh, rely on, and of course then they become a lot more vulnerable to a, a bad actor, someone that may be thinking of doing something that's not in the best interest of the elder. The second group would be like contractors, vendors, um, who basically will take advantage of an elder, you know, with uh, prices that are unreasonable, uh, services that they may not need, that they don't know that they don't need. Uh, you hear a lot about contractors telling, uh, coming through a neighborhood and talking to an elder. Uh, we had a case where an elder, somebody came to her door and a contractor said, I'm doing the roof across the street from you and I could do your roof for, you know, 50% off. And of course they don't do it. She gave them a bunch of money up front and she thought it was a good deal. Um, but it wasn't and they, they know a lot of them uh, may not check to see if the prices are right. They may have received information from the, the house that they were actually doing work for that there was a senior living across the street, things like that. Then there are out and out scams, swindlers, con men, people who actually target seniors. We had a situation where um, there was, um, let me see, which one? Well, I'm going to actually talk about a, a couple at the end of this. But one of them was um, selling them um, interest in a small business so that they could supplement their income. And of course, there is no such small business. And they, they got together about five or six individuals. They were all seniors, and they all chipped in $2,000, which may not be an outrageous amount of money, but most of these clients were on SSI. So um, $2,000, if they had, would have been everything that they had, if uh, you're aware of uh, SSI rules of assets. And so, uh, and then they were told that for this investment, they'll, they'll get a, like a hundred dollars a month return every two months or something kind of weird. And at first, I thought that doesn't make sense to me. But I think if a person is only living off of like eight hundred and seventy-five dollars a month, you know, getting fifty dollars extra a month or whatever is a lot to them. And so they were induced into doing that because they thought it was a good deal. It'll just help them a uh, just kind of uh, with monthly bills and whatnot. Uh, I also included trusted professionals, insurance agents, or people pretending to be insurance agents, mortgage brokers, and as well as legal. Um, sometimes they're in conjunction with contractors and service vendors where everything looks official because a lawyer or someone that says they're a lawyer drew up these contracts. And so an elderly person is will trust that it's, everything's legitimate and get taken advantage of. Okay, the next few slides are, are kind of something that will just will be best just to read on your own, but just to give you an idea, this is the definition of financial abuse. It's the Elder Independent Act Civil Protection. And um, it talks about the different uh, you know, taking, secreting, appropriating, assisting in taking. It could be a individual or an entity, because before it was just individual. So entity could be a company. So there's an employer-employee connection now that you could go after a company as well as the person that tried to sell the bad annuity or tr try to put the new roof on your, or the maybe not even a real roof uh, on your house, things like that. Go after them. Um, Undue influence was also included. This wasn't always a part of this law. and that, That's just another factor to work with, with whatever facts that uh, you have in a particular case. And uh, wrongful use of. So basically, you look at this, it's all, all different ways of trying to get people who are lying, stealing, or breaking a promise um, 
that they made with an elder and, and knowing that they're working with an elder or a dependent adult. Dependent adults oftentimes are adults with disabilities that kind of come under the same act here. Uh, the next slide is talks about attorney's fees. And this kind of, um, this was put in because that way uh, civil attorneys will be able to take these cases. A lot of our elders are low income, may not have the, the means to hire an attorney to um, go after some of these um, the cases that, that are, are out there. And so there are attorney's fees, there's damages, as well as punitive damages. So it's something that is a good tool to also use when you're considering taking an elder abuse case. But read it at your leisure because there's a lot of different little parts of it. And even now, even though I've been doing this for several years, every time I get a case, I'm always reviewing the law to make sure it's, it's, I have all the facts and, and things to be able to argue certain elements. Uh, this is another one. This, I, the um, 15657.6 return of property rescission. I do a lot of this as well because many of my cases, they don't necessarily go f all the way to court. And a lot of times my client, because as my earlier slide indicated, a lot of times the perpetrator or the bad actor, the family member, a lot of people, you know, they don't want to actually go all the way through trying to uh, to uh, push a claim through against their grandson or their niece or their somebody that's a, a family member. And they just want the bad act to stop or they want the money returned or the, you know, the property returned. And this is also uh, something that you could, uh, you should include in any kind of uh, a lawsuit. Um, I like the Consumers Legal Remedies Act. It's not basically just for elders. It's, it's, ba it's for any consumer. And uh, talking about unfair competition, misrepresenting different parts of a transaction, whether it's you know where the goods come from, or people that are affiliated with it, or you know this will do something when it really won't do that. If it's something isn't, uh, they they put forth that it's a brand new television when basically it was refurbished or something. They have to disclose all these things. Um, and sometimes you're able to use some of these um, causes of action or this act to be able to press forward um, a case against um, a company or a vendor that, that's taken advantage of an elder. There's a couple of clauses specific to elder, the home solicitation one, number three. Um, which is on a couple pages away. But basically, um, it's for everybody, but I also like to use it a lot of times in my elder abuse um, actions as well. So, yeah, number 23 is specific to elders, senior citizen where a loan is made. Basically, it ties in the, uh, the house, so there's a mechanics lien against the house. And um, that basically is usually in conjunction with a, a contractor and a vendor and then trying to um, get into the equity of the house, the senior's house. And this is some more. I just wanted to include some law because I know some people really want to have something in hand. I do have a list that I'm also going to provide that will list a lot of different causes of action that can be used in a um, elder abuse case, financial elder abuse case. Slide number 15. So the elder abuse, the first one I provided you with, with the, um, on that. Fraud, constructive fraud, deceit, negligence, conversion, those are common counts, the ones that we used to have to use before elder law uh, statutes were were uh, available to us. Uh, breach of fiduciary duty, that's another good one. A lot of times um, when you have a caregiver or someone who's in charge of the finances um, appropriating or negligently using that, that's what we also try to use. 
precision is um, a, used in a lot of things. I, tr I try to use whatever cause of action is applicable. So there might be 10, 15 causes of action for one transaction or, or one particular instance of uh, elder abuse. Just You just never know what, what facts will come out as you go through discovery, and you would use the same discovery tools that you would in any other type of litigation. There's a couple of other laws that I forgot to mention on this one, but um, yes. Uh, in California, there's also the unauthorized practice of law. You have people or sometimes paralegals um, drafting documents and an elderly person. They, they may not distinguish what a paralegal is from a lawyer, and they assume that it's a lawyer, or even it might not even be a paralegal. Um, so there's a, there is, under California, there's a statute of unauthorized practice of law. Under federal law, there's also a telemarketing sales rule about when people call the house. There's also a deceptive mail prevention and enforcement act. That's basically um, how mail, that's out of junk mail that comes to your house. They have to be specific. Uh, like, they can't just say you're a winner, which if you're not a winner, and what's in those like magazine sweepstakes and things like that, they have to have other language there so to indicate to a reasonable per person that it's not, doesn't mean that you actually won $50,000, you have to do all these other things. So, and that's a private cause of action, you know, so you could attack that on if it's applicable. Um, and again, the damages. It encourages attorneys to take these cases, especially since a lot of times um, there aren't going to be attorney's fees until the end of the, the lawsuit. Trouble damages, um, and that's helpful to know. Punitive damages, it, again, it's best to actually look at the law and look at the facts that you have to see what, which one of these causes of actions, which statute would be applicable that you can use um, when filing a complaint. Uh, why is elder abuse underreported? Um, a lot of reasons. Fear and shame. You know, being embarrassed that you're being taken advantage of by your son or your daughter or, or somebody that you know. Or that um, a lot of times elders get really worried about capacity issues, like as they get older, you know, did I um, say yes and say I was going to do that? And then now it turns out that it was a bad decision. They get really kind of um, sensitive and stressed about issues of their judgment um, being in question. So a lot of times they may not say anything until it gets really, really bad, unfortunately. And oftentimes, you know, by the time the case comes to us, you know, a lot of times pass and a lot of things have happened. But the fear and the shame is, is a major uh, part of that. Lack of access. Um, some people don't know that there are, are, um, are agencies or attorneys that are willing to take these cases. You know, we have a lot of low income clients and so um, lack of resources. They figure that attorney won't help them because they don't have any money. They can't pay. They, they don't know that some attorneys will be willing to help take these cases. And like I said, trouble damages, you know, punitives, things like that, uh, attorney's fees, it, it, it's all there to encourage attorneys to take these cases. Culture uh, plays another role. Um, again, the majority of our cases are low income, non-English speakers. A lot of them are immigrants, so they, they, they get a little bit worried about uh, going entering the legal system, um, they're not a U.S. citizen, they think that they're not going to be treated fairly, uh, the financial cost again, um, the lack of education, they, they get intimidated uh, with that type of thing. Also being uh, fearful of being isolated from their own family. If, if they uh, raise a red flag against their son or niece or nephew or grandchild or something like that, you know, what, what is it going to do to the family? And I always try to explain to them, you know, if something like this happens, there's already some stuff happening in the family that should be addressed anyway. But, um, but in uh, California, one of our studies, um, oh, basically based on the census, is that 43% of California residents speak a language other than English at home. And it's a, a lot higher than any other state. And um, 
The census in 2000 estimated that 28% of San Francisco seniors are having um, trouble speaking English. Nearly uh, three-fourths three of these seniors speak either an Asian or Pacific Islander language. Also, the 2000 uh, census report says that there's, I guess, almost 3.6 million people now 65 and older living in California. That's the 2000 census, so the, it'll be interesting to see what the 2010 census says. Um, they're, they're estimating that by two, 2020 in California, there'll be over 9 million. So we'll see it with the 2010 census how true um, that is, or if we're on, on point to, to reaching that number. This, is, um, this chart is a lo local um, study by the Department of Status of Women. And unfortunately, I could, I could only fit it on two pages. Um, but this is from the Family Violence Council in here in San Francisco. And they look at child abuse, domestic violence, and elder abuse, just family violence and, and ways of preventing it and, and how best the city can address these issues. And they broke it down, you know, child abuse, violence, elder abuse, and um, if you look at it, the first line is about um, the hotlines. Unfortunately, there is no elder abuse hotline. There's a domestic violence hotline. There's a child abuse hotline. Um, so it's hard to kind of uh, break out from that. Domestic violence, some of that may encompass elder abuse because domestic violence, it, it all depends on the relationship. If there's a family relationship, and if it's a physical abuse type of thing, then they, it might get clumped into the domestic violence number, so it's kind of unclear. The second line is calls received by CPS Child Protective Service, 911, and Adult Protective Service. So you can see that elder abuse is about 6,000 calls, domestic violence roughly 6,000, and uh, child abuse uh, a little over 5,000. And um, I'm going to go to the next page because what I kind of thought was disturbing was um, the cases that actually um, became um, in, well, investigated by the police and then eventually dealt with through the district attorney's office. And of course, this is criminal stuff. But uh, if you look at it, none were brought to trial. There were no convictions. There were 10 that was pled out. And that seems kind of, that means a lot were dropped. And again, back to the the bad actor being a family member or whatnot, a lot of times um, it might be difficult for the district attorney to go forward with a case um, if the witness or the prime party is not willing to cooperate. Um, and also, it's a lot of work and money for the district attorney to prosecute these criminal cases. I think we were kind of, well, I was kind of hopeful after the, um, the New York case where um, there was um, a high-profile elder abuse case, the Brooke Astor case, where there was a conviction. The son was convicted of elder abuse against his mother. And I believe the attorney was also disbarred because of uh, some improprieties that he had done in some of her um, estate planning. And I was hoping that that would kind of be the O.J. Simpson uh, case for elder abuse. Uh, I mean, uh, for elder abuse, too. That O.J. Simpson case was for domestic violence, where, where people were into it and they, they followed it. I followed it for the two years that it, it came, um, and uh, there was a uh, conviction last year. Um, but that case was um, high profile because, or at least it was on the East Coast, because she was a prominent woman um, in New York and uh, a well, very, very wealthy. And um, and the district attorney, they, they had um, assistance because she had servants, so there were witnesses, uh, even though the servants one by one were, were fired and isolated away from her by the son, there were enough um, witnesses to be able to piece together what, she, what used to be and then what kind of happened, and they were able to get a conviction. So, um, but unfortunately, you know, most of our cases, uh, the district attorneys won't have the resources, and that might be reflected as why a lot of these cases don't go forward. Um, the national information, I, I did a pie chart, and I'm sh sorry, it didn't come out as the way I anticipated. Uh, 
I hope you guys can see the colors okay, but the child abuse is 91% of the funds for, uh, for neglect and abuse. And that translates to $6.7 billion that goes towards the prevention of child abuse. Uh, domestic violence is 7%, and that translates to $520 million. Elder abuse is 2%. That translates into $153 million. And that's um, going to have to change as, as um, the demographics um, already show. And hopefully with the um, Equal Justice Act, that might change. That's supposed to provide funding for elder abuse prevention. And, um, but it, it all depends. You know, there's a new Congress in town now, so we'll see how that goes. The original one had a lot more teeth. Unfortunately, a lot of it got whittled down uh, through the process. So we shall see. I'm sorry I'm, I seem to be going through this so quickly. I, there's so much to cover. And I wanted to be able to kind of talk about some of the cases that we have seen. Um, okay, this is a case that happened a couple years ago. Uh, our office was involved in, um, I call it the scooter fraud. And um, it was actually Medicare fraud. What happened is that uh, Medicare does not cover scooters unless that's the only way a person to get a, could get around. They will rather provide a, a wheelchair, uh, whatnot. And of course, everybody wants a scooter. It, it looks cooler. Um, they could get them farther and, and whatever. But what happened here was um, a, a young person approached a senior outside a senior center and um, said that they work for a company that could um, that have been have been successful in getting Medicare to pay for scooters, and that it's like a guaranteed thing. You just have to be um, examined by one of their doctors, and they do all the paperwork. And you know, within six weeks or eight weeks or whatever amount of time it is, you know, you'll get approval, or you should be able to get approval. And if you don't, you know, our office will work with them and whatnot. And they said that if um, if you could bring a friend or two, we will provide lunch and we'll provide transportation. We can pick you up right here in front of this community center. And so the senior thought this was a good deal. He was he had um, one of those little walker things. And um, so he's able to move around. He wasn't wheelchair bound. And uh, so anyway, he said that, yeah, I'll get a couple of friends. And he got like three friends. And they um, set up a date. And sure enough, a van came, picked them up, and drove them somewhere. Now, the senior couldn't identify where. He just says it was kind of far away. It turned out to be some kind of a office park outside of San Francisco. We're not sure exactly where. And, uh, and it was basically an office. Um, it looked like, he said, a vacant kind of, like not a lot of offices were there, but there were a couple offices they went in. There was a phone. There were some chairs. Somebody did a couple. Somebody in a white jacket did a couple of different tests on them, but it was. It sounded like maybe a blood pressure test. They didn't draw blood. There was no urine. There was no. Nobody, you know, did major. There weren't any machines there, but um, they had to. The seniors had to give them their Medicare information so that they could submit the application, and the doctor was going to sign all these documents and whatnot. Well, what happened was. Um, a few weeks later, the seniors, each of them, started getting um, bills for Medicare, which is normal. Basically, um, it's just to inform the, the senior or the recipient of the services that services were, uh, a bill was submitted for those services. And it, it was thousands of dollars. And it was just to inform them. Well, it freaked out these seniors because they're saying, you know, I never got a bill that high. And I'm not sure um, do I have to pay. They, they were a little bit worried. And then they also received, uh, a few weeks after that, uh, calls from the FBI as well as the local police. Um, apparently, there was some kind of um, investigation because there were several bills, similar bills, I guess all for scooters, coming out of the Bay Area. And so the, the FBI had contacted these four people. And so, of course, they were really, really 
scared and really stressed. And uh, one person had a mild heart attack. Uh, I don't know for sure if it was related to this, but when the FBI and the police came calling him, and he is a green card holder, so he was all freaked out about whether he was going to lose his uh, citizen, uh, uh, his uh, green card. So we, as well as another attorney in my office, we, we met with the four individuals. We spoke with the uh, FBI um, who wanted to, uh, to interview them. They were interviewed. We spoke to them. And basically, they, they felt that the seniors were innocent parties. And they weren't uh, in cahoots with the, the doctors or whoever they were. And uh, so it became a good outcome. But it actually took about six or seven months. And that's one type of fraud uh, that we dealt with recently. Actually, we heard that there was another one similar to that, too, in another part of uh, California, unfortunately. Um, this is a, a case that came recently. Um, I'm not sure. It could be identity theft, because that's another area that is starting to really uh, get popular within the, the elders um, community, partly because I think Due to the loneliness and isolation, you know, a lot of times um, an elderly person, when a telemarketer calls, they will stop what they're doing and talk to them and give them a lot more information than they really ought to. Uh, but in this particular case, I had a, a client that, um, that came in who um, said that there was something wrong with her bank account. She had contacted the bank, and they're doing an investigation. And unfortunately, it's kind of hard to read. But you can tell that there are two handwritten checks, and then there are three like pre-printed checks. So the two handwritten checks are her legitimate checks. And she only wrote two or three checks a month. She, um, you know, she, uh, again, another low-income person, the only thing she, one is for her uh, garbage bill, and one is for PG&E. And um, she walks in and pays for her telephone bill, and she walks to the landlord's apartment, which is next door, and pays her rent. So she doesn't use her checking account for a whole lot of things. And so what happened was somebody somewhere got a hold of some of the information, and they generated these checks. And there were uh, electronic checks. And there's not even a signature. It's kind of hard to read. I'm, I couldn't get it any bigger. But it says signature not required because it's already been authorized by the um, the bank account holder. And um, she didn't catch this until three or four months after it started. And basically because, again, it's really hard to read, but the amount that the checks were for were like for $37, $42. And they were like these odd numbers. Nothing was round. It was just $42.19. And, and so the first couple of months, it was only one check. So it was only like $41. She didn't notice it, but she just she glanced at her uh, statement. And she doesn't get her um, canceled checks. She had to request these in order for her to, to get them. So she uh, was really uh, upset by it. And by the time she, she caught it was this month, where there were four, uh, three checks and a total like $110, which was substantial for her at this point. But at, at $39, she didn't really notice it. And so. Um, the bank was able to reimburse her for some of uh, the, the, the ones that were within um, the amount of time that they require, because the first month she missed the window period to report it back to the bank. But they did launch an investigation. Um, she, she closed her account. And they said the investigation is still pending. And um, it's been about two months now. But I think identity theft is really a major issue among our seniors, too. So that's. That's a criminal part, but if you're able to locate who the perpetrators are, then there are civil uh, causes of action, potentially. Um, this one is a financial abuse by a family member. Uh, so I had a, a couple who owned a small home. They had a little bit of cash in their, in their account. And um, he had a son from his first marriage. And um, he had uh, a daughter also, but in this family, the son is coveted as um, the carrier of the name. So anyway, he, the son was getting married, and um, he, they were expecting their first child. So it would be the first grandchild for, for this client. And there was a promise made that, you know, um, basically the son told the, the father that since, since um, I'm 
having a baby, we want to buy a house, and this and that. And one thing led to another, and the father said that, hey, you know, I'll help you. And he offered to give them X amount of dollars, and it wasn't quite enough for, I guess, the type of house that the son wanted. And after a couple of more conversations, the son uh, and the father, or at least uh, on the part of the father, he thought the agreement was, I'm going to sell my house, turn over the equity to my son, and as well as kick in the money that I have, and then we're going to buy this bigger house, and we're all going to live in there together. And it sounded wonderful to my client, because then he would be able to live with his only son, and live with his grandchild, and he was happy, happy, happy. Well, that didn't happen. They, um, of course, everything was verbal, but there was a paper trail, because my client did sell his house. He turned over the money. You could follow the trail. The money went to this trust uh, bank account, and then went into an escrow account, and then it went to this big house. But they didn't, uh, the son and the wife and the newborn moved into the house and uh, told the grandparents who are, have been now renting that, oh, well, we're doing some upgrades, we're fixing up a place in the, you know, the back of the house or something. And they were able to talk, talk around it for two or three months, four months after they moved in, that the grandparents were, were asking, when can we move in? And they said, well, no, it's not ready yet. We're doing something special so that you have handrails so you won't fall, blah, blah, blah. It sounded reasonable. But after four, five, six months, you know, the, the father was getting a little upset. And so, um, and then the thing that happened was the son hired an attorney to, tell the, to write a letter to the father to tell him, stop bothering me about this. <laughs> so that was a major blow to my client. So he contacted our office, and um, we started talking to the attorney that issued the letter. And uh, it's, she, did, she had no clue about you know, who bought the house and all that type of thing, or at least that's what she, um, she said to me. And so we ended up having to file a suit because uh, we were getting kind of um, towards the end of the statute of limitation of, of when the actual transaction occurred. And so uh, through discovery and through some um, uh, mediation, we were able to come to a settlement. Unfortunately, my client never got their house back. They just got some money back. But um, that is typical that a lot of times it, it does not go all the way to trial. My, my client opted to take less money and try to restore as much peace in the family than to just go all the way to the mat and try to take away the house or, or whatnot. They actually had to borrow money against the house in order to, to repay the grandparent, uh, the parents, I'm sorry. Uh, but that is very typical in, in many of the elder abuse cases is that a lot of them will be settled before um, going uh, towards trial just because um, the family dynamics and the relationship issues. Okay, resources. Uh, we have a website. People can contact us through our website. Uh, local Adult Protective Services. Um, they're good because uh, they have access to local resources for your clients. I mean, a lot of times they will provide transportation to client meetings. They will provide uh, translation or interpretation services. Oftentimes they will help find documents, things like that. Um, they've been hit, uh, unfortunately, with a lot of the California budget crisis things, so some of them aren't doing as much as they used to. But they are still a very good resource for attorneys. Um, they also are a referral. They, they do refer a lot of cases, a lot of the civil cases to civil attorneys, because if they know that the district attorney isn't going to do anything um, about it, because the burden is a lot different, right? Um, if it's criminal, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. But in elder uh, financial abuse, it's um, preponderance of the evidence. And if it's fraud or misrepresentation, it's clear and convincing evidence. So um, a lot of cases will filter down to us through the district attorney's office or through adult protective services. Another um, resource I didn't put up here, but the, in the district attorney's office is a victim witness office. And they work with the DA. And they also provide services similar to adult protective services. But you know, they could uh, get you police reports a lot faster, things like that. So I, we utilize all of these different sources, including um, 
the district attorney's office, as well as all of our community-based groups that serve, serve um, seniors. The National Committee for the Prevention of Elder Abuse, I put a website there. It's, it's a good starting off point. They, they have a lot of different um, uh, resources available. And then locally, the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform Canner, they're a really good resource as well. Um, I just want to give credit that um, one of my law clerks this summer and fall helped put together a lot of the information in this uh, particular PowerPoint. Uh, there's so much that goes into elder abuse, and basically uh, my recommendation is really read all the statutes that you think might apply to see if the facts that you have before you might fit into any of those, or even if they're pretty close, because through discovery you might be able to find out a lot more. Um, Stephen Reese of the Law Office of Stephen Reese, I shamelessly used his uh, a lot of the laws. He compiled together in a nice, neat little package that was really easy to use. Uh, but you know, just take a look at the different laws. Be creative. See what you can put together. Uh, I think California, we're, we're fortunate because there are a lot more protections uh, for our elders as well as consumers, which elders are as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, we should try to take these cases so that other states will follow suit. Even though all 50 states have statutes, a lot of them um, they're not always as, as um, strong as some of the, the, the statutes that we have here in California. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer if I can, or uh, people can email me. I put my email address there. Um, okay. You can call me. Uh, I think I left a number there, but if not, it's 415-567-6255. I think we have about 10 minutes to take some questions. Five so um, this is Sydney Howe again. Um, we do have a couple of questions here, um, a couple regarding uh, long-term care. And um, we just have one quick comment from a participant that uh, the Canner website uh, on slide 15, but sorry, slide 25, should read uh, canhr.org. Um, there was a switch with the RMEH. Oh, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that everybody everybody knew that if you're not familiar with Canner already. So um, we have uh, two questions about long-term care. And again, feel free to uh, submit questions as they come in, as, uh, as we go through this. So the first one is uh, the long-term care ombudsman program is responsible for investigating suspected elder and dependent abuse that uh, occurs in long-term care and adult day facilities. Did the San Francisco study include elder abuse cases that were referred to SFPD by the long-term care ombudsman program? They are part of the Family Violence um, Council. I believe not all of them, just because a lot of the information are from 911 calls, APS, and CPS. If they're reported to APS, then yes. Uh, but most of the stuff I'm trying to do just with the financial elder abuse, and it gets kind of hard because a lot of the statistics are a mixture of both the physical abuse as well as the financial abuse. And within the um, nursing homes or boarding care or whatnot, there could be both. But I think there's a tendency more towards um, the physical abuse. I hope that answers your question. Great. Um, then we've got another comment um, about jurisdiction with uh, regarding long-term care. So uh, Debbie Johnson says, for resources, please remember there are two distinct senior populations, those residing in their own homes with family or in depend independent apartments in the community and those who are institutionalized. Uh, abuse complaints are received and investigated in California by either APS or the long-term care ombudsman, uh, those residing in an institution, skilled nursing facility, or residential care facility, are under the jurisdiction of the ombudsman for abuse events investigation, and those residing outside of a facility are under the jurisdiction of APS. So uh, that was just a quick clarification, I think, from uh, from Debbie Johnson. Thank you. I think most of our cases are outside of those facilities, so our focus is usually <laughs> APS and just people living on their own. But we would be willing to assist in other cases if they were brought to us. We just don't get too many of those kinds of calls in our office. 
Great. So I'll just give everybody another second to submit some questions. Um, again, if you do have a question, please submit it in the question box. Um, I cannot uh, uh, respond to raised hands. So um, if, you, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the question box, and um, I, I will pass it along to Akiko. And if, if you think of questions after, you could always email me. Uh, sometimes I have to do research because if it's not something that I do regularly, um, I could do research on it as well. And if for some reason you're having trouble using the question box, you can also email me at showe at six.org. Um, all right, we've got another question. Uh, do you work throughout California? No, basically we work out of San Francisco, Alameda, and San Mateo County. All right. We have an office in um, San Francisco and then another office in Oakland. Great. All right, we've got a another question. Because financial elder abuse can be a sensitive subject, how do you get victims to come forward? Is there any special outreach that you do? That's a really good question. I didn't really get a chance to get into it so much. Is Most of our, uh, our cases are referred to us by community-based groups. So um, lunch programs, senior centers, um, some, sometimes uh, there are low-income housing units, the, the building manager. Uh, APS refers a lot of cases because um, a lot of social workers uh, are mandatory reporters. So very rarely do they come in. The only ones that walk in are like the stranger ones, like you know the contractor you know is ripping me off or the bank you know taking my money, you know things like that. They may walk in on their own, but when it's family and things like that, they'll tell somebody that will tell somebody that will tell somebody, and then finally maybe a community-based group will hear about it and contact them and say, hey, why don't you just talk to um, API Legal Outreach and they'll explain things to you. And you know we try to do it in a non um, in intimidating manner. Uh, we'll listen to them. We'll give them options. It's totally up to them if they want to go forward because, again, be the sensi uh, being sensitive to the fact that it's a family uh, situation as well. And that's why, um, as I stated earlier, most of our cases um, don't go to trial, number one. Several of our cases don't even uh, get filed as, as, as uh, causes of action. I'll talk to the so-called bad actor. I had a situation where um, a senior transferred an um, adult to his house to his oldest son, again, because, you know, the oldest son syndrome. And, um, but the understanding was the uh, senior parents could stay there for the rest of their life, and the, the son will eventually get the house, and he would pay uh, the maintenance and um, pay for certain bills. And he did that for two, three years. And then all of a sudden, he stopped. And he wanted to um, get the parents. There was an in-law. I think it was an illegal in-law in the house. They wanted the parents to move from the house into the illegal in-law so the son could rent out the house. And the, um, the, the son was becoming more aggressive about it. You know, I'm going to help you move. I'm going to. He would start moving some of the big furniture around, which you know was not cool. And um, Eventually, uh, a community-based group, well, I don't know if it was community-based, it was Mahjong group, somebody from the Mahjong group knew somebody else who knew somebody else, and they contacted our office through a, um, a community uh, um, person. And I sat down with the elder, and I found out what happened, and he didn't want uh, the police involved. You know, they always think when you go to a lawyer that we're somewhat connected to the police. But um, I told them, no, um, I could do this. I'll call your son and talk to him first. And that's basically what I did. I said, you know, your father came to my eye. I'm an attorney. And your father came to me because he has, he's kind of worried about a situation. And he, he claims that he has, basically, he didn't have a life estate, but that's what he was telling me he had. There was no, no, nothing in writing. And, um, and he's very concerned that you want him to move out of his home and blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, and then I asked him, well, when did you get title of the house? Because it was kind of unclear, and I hadn't had a chance to take a look at it. And he was like, I don't remember. And he was very abrupt with me. But I contacted my client, and I told him I called him. And I sent a follow-up letter, just kind of a, a non-threatening follow-up letter that, you know, we're just kind of concerned, and your dad's a little worried, and blah, blah, blah. And then the son stopped. So 
the father gets to live there, and you know, so everything's okay for the time being. And I and I check in on him through the community um, service guy uh, every couple of uh, about six months just to see. But a lot of our cases are getting to be more like that, especially when there's uh, a family member involved. Um, we have time for about one more question before one, um, just to be respectful of everyone's time. Akiko, I want to check in with you and see if um, we can go um, a few minutes over, if um, if that's yeah, possible. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay? All right. Um, then we've got about time for one more question before one, and then I will uh, give everyone some logistical information, and then we can continue with some more questions for those who want to stay on. So um, we have a question that says, uh, what are the consequences for mandated reports who failed to report abuse? Okay, I didn't really get into that either. Mandated reporter, there are certain groups of people who work with children or adults or, de or uh, dependent adults that are mandatory reporters if there's a, a risk of harm. And I am not that sure what the actual uh, penalty is because it's like social workers and doctors and teachers. So um, I don't know. I, know. I basically will tell people that they are consequences and that you are um, a mandatory reporter. And so, but I don't know exactly what the penalty is. It might be a license type of situation where there might be a ding on their, their license because a lot of them are licensed, whether they're a teacher or a um, social worker. Uh, but uh, a lot of times, um, we do have social workers that will call me or our office and say, I have a situation, I'm not sure what it is, can you talk to them? And I think that's their shorthand way of saying, I don't want to get in it until, it, it, you know, I, I don't know if, it, if it's a thing that I have to report yet, I don't know enough about it, but they want me to talk to them because they know that we, we as attorneys have a, um, the attorney-client privilege. So a lot of times, you know, I will meet with them uh, because a social worker is not sure if, if it's something they have to report yet. But uh, as far as what the specific penalties or the consequences, there, there are. I just don't know specifically what they are. OK, great. Well, um, I would like to thank everybody for joining us for today's training on financial elder abuse basics, and thank Akiko for sharing this great presentation with us. We will continue taking questions after I just give everybody some administrative uh, information. Um, just so all of you know, I will be sending out MCLE materials um, at some point later this week or early next week. Uh, this is our uh, first uh, webinar in the series on elder abuse. The uh, next part of LAC's Elder Abuse Series is tomorrow, Thursday, December 2nd, at noon. And tomorrow's session is Elder Estate Planning Abuse. This session will give uh, an update and overview of Medi-Cal for nursing homes, as well as some insights into various scams against seniors, such as the Medi-Cal trust mills, long-term care insurance problems, unsuitable annuities, unsuitable reverse mortgages, and the abuse of veterans aid and attendance program. This webinar will be presented by Prescott Cole of the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. Um, if you would like to register, please email me at shwe at pic.org. And again, MCLE will be sent out, but it might be a little bit late this week because uh, we do have a three-part elder abuse series uh, which continues tomorrow and Friday. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to Akiko um, for more questions. Um, we have an additional question that says, um, I'm, listening from, I'm listening from Illinois. I work with the probate court as a GAL. I have had a few cases of potential financial abuse of the guardian, and then one found out that it was not abuse as much as not knowing how to work with the money of the guardian. Uh, also, I found it very difficult when uh, there is an elder with dementia. Um, are there any thoughts on that, Akiko? Well, I'm not familiar with Illinois law, but negligence is also abuse. So if a guardian ad litem, they're in charge of dealing with certain um, duties, and they're not able to do it because they don't know, that's really not an excuse. I mean, not in California, at least. So if they're negligently misusing the money, that's also considered abuse in California. Okay. Great. 
Uh, we have another one that says, I have been involved with a family with a trust. A family member wanted to read what his aunt stipulated in the trust as a cousin seemingly was misspending the funds. The attorney, executor, and cousin, trustee, uh, told him the trust was confidential. What are his options? His aunt does not have capacity. So the aunt is still alive, um, uh, it sounds like. Uh, Cindy, if you would like to um, send another answer to that, um, and I, I can't, um, uh, I can't do anything with your. No, with your I mean, I, I just, it's kind of hard to, because um, I'm not sure if it's the trust or if it, there's a power of attorney or some kind of directive that allows the executor, cousin, lawyer to administer the trust. And I'm not sure what that is. I mean, you would have to probably do a cause of action because the trust might be confidential to a certain degree. It's okay. hard to say. OK. Um, well, if there are any more questions, um, not seeing any more, any more new questions. So um, I think that is um, all for today, and thank you again, Akiko, for this wonderful presentation. And I would look forward to um, seeing you. Oh, we have we have one more quick question. Okay, um, uh, how can an elder rebuke a POA? Oh, you just you can do a revocation. Just uh, I revoke the power of attorney that I signed March fifteenth, two thousand five, or you could do a new one. So if you do a new one, then that will supersede any of the old ones. The only thing that gets weird is you got to make sure that the new one is available so people know. So in the event that a power of attorney has to go into action, that they look to the most current one versus an old one that somebody might pull out of a drawer. Great. And uh, Cindy, I see that your hand is raised. I can't unmute you. So if yeah, you could email Akiko um, your question, then that would probably um, be best. Um, yes. So um, uh, that's a good comment for, for for you guys to have during email over email. Um, thanks again for joining us, and uh, I hope to see you tomorrow for um, our next uh, partner elder abuse series. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.